Mike Agarbo here with John Beeler. Awesome show today. I'm super excited. Uh, later on, uh, we will be talking with Dunker, Dunker, Duncan Stewart from Deloitte, Canada. We've got the tech predictions for 2020. There's some crazy stuff. Yeah, and these aren't just like made up. They're, these are actually based on a lot of statistics and analysis that Duncan's team has spent a lot of time putting together. And so there's some really fascinating stuff in there. Uh, everything from e-bikes to robots and something that we need to know more and more about it, artificial intelligence. It's getting bigger and bigger. And there's some uh, fun and kind of scary predictions around AI or artificial intelligence for uh, the coming year. We'll also be talking with uh, our good friend, Aaron Lawrence from techgadgetscanada.com about fitness tech. What kind of uh, fitness wearable should you be looking at? I think we could all use one of these. We could, certainly could. <laughs> yeah. Some of us have them and maybe could use them better. Should turn them on. Let's talk about some of the tech news now, John. Uh, we've got a lot of interesting stories we're following. One and I thought this was super interesting, uh, super interesting. JBL. Yes. They make uh, speakers, headphones. They have a solar powered headphone set that delivers unlimited listening. Yes. This is a really cool kind of one of those, why haven't we had this before kind of things. It's like when they built a solar panel into calculators. Right. And actually there's a, there's a connection to that. They've actually... Uh, on the headband of these headphones, they're using a very similar uh, solar foil that these calculators actually have. So you actually have a, a full-size battery inside one of the headphones, and with a full charge, you'll get 96 hours of battery life. And But that's with a full charge. So if you're outside, it'll just be constantly topping it up. So if you go somewhere dark, you've got 96 hours of playback time. Okay, so if I'm locked in a room with no light, 96 yes, hours. Yes, but... How's the, that possible? But the great thing is... How big are these batteries? The, the, the great thing is, is that these also work in indirect lighting and even office lighting. Really? So you'll be constantly charging these headphones. Uh, are they wireless or wired? Wireless. Wireless headphones never have to charge them. Yeah. Take my money... And here's the great okay, thing. But do they look crazy? No, they look normal. Yeah. They look they look really good. Okay, you show me a picture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the the interesting thing is, um, JBL is actually using a crowdsourcing campaign to get their customers involved in sort of the design process to help fine tune things before they actually ship. Okay, so they're not shipping yet. No, they're, they're going to be having this campaign on until about the middle of January. Uh, for ninety nine dollars US, you can pl plunk your money down, and you'll probably get them in the fall. This is amazing. This is going to change everything. Yeah, I think so. It's a pretty cool. I'm excited about this. Yeah. Because I hate having to charge all the millions of gadgets I have now. Right. Because we literally, you and I both have like a corner of our house that's just charging cables yeah, and right. wireless corner, pads. Corner. I've got a room. <laughs> I've got a room. My wife hates me. <laughs> I'm going to get divorced if I don't get rid of some of these. Why cables. don't we have like a, you know how you can have like in floor heating? Yes. Why can't you have in floor wireless charging? So you just throw your phone on the floor and it'll charge it. Oh, yeah. That would be better. <laughs> you, you and I will be living together. That's right. In the, the worst, messiest house. Okay, let's move on here. I'm loving this here. Chrome will automatically scan your passwords against data breaches. So Google Chrome, one of the more popular web browsers out there, available on desktop and on smartphones and tablets. And so it's automatically scanning your passwords now? Mm -hmm. To make sure that they're not part of a data breach somewhere. Yeah. Well, every time you, you know, if you're using Chrome regularly and you're logged in, it actually you have the ability to store your passwords so that it knows the website and the username and password for that website if it needs one. And so now it's actually checking uh, a system to see, you know, hey, you might actually have already been compromised with this particular account. Really? Yeah. Well, how great is that? Until they I mean, get hacked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean. <laughs> I, I've gone to a few uh, websites to check to see if I've been hacked. Yeah. You know, I always worry though when I go to those websites. I know. Am I, are they then getting my information in, <laughs> to hack you're, me later? You're, you're giving them all the, yeah. the stuff. Yeah. What is that one? You've been pwned or? Yeah, I've been pwned. I've been pwned. Have I been pwned or something like that? Yeah. yeah. So this will do it for you now. Yeah. There's actually been extensions for a while that can sort of monitor this, like official Chrome extensions from Google, but now they've baked it into the browser itself. So if you have the latest version of Chrome, which you should always be updating anyways. Yeah. Doesn't it automatically update? It does. 
But sometimes, depending on your settings, you yeah. can actually stop that update. You'll notice if you use Chrome in the top right corner, there's like a little uh, little down arrow that if it's green, you're good to go. If it's yellow or orangish, then it, there's an update waiting to be applied. So you either need to click that or just reboot your machine and then it'll it'll apply it. Let's talk about uh, home tech or home automation tech, which I'm just loving right now because I'm finally feeling that we're getting to the Jetsons age. You know, I'm able to talk to my house and turn the lights on. And well, you've got a flying car. I, I <laughs> Almost. It's a Tesla. <laughs> uh, one day it'll be flying, I'm hoping. It looks hope. like a spaceship. It looks like a spaceship. Uh, so the challenge I'm having though, John, it's been kind of okay, but you got to kind of pick an ecosystem, yes. right? Uh, much like our smartphones. Google and Android, there are some big players in the home automation space. Uh, you know, we can think of the main ones like Apple and uh, Google, you know, with Nest and uh, Amazon, huge, huge. Ring. With Ring. And all the Alexa stuff. All the Alexa stuff. Uh, and then, you know, there's all sorts of these different types of standards like Zigbee and things that people have never heard of. Right. But there's good news. Yes. They've kissed and made up. Apparently, Apple, Google, and Amazon are going to collaborate together on one standard. What's interesting is that this is supposed to be an open source standard. Okay. Which means no one's going to profit off of it. Yeah. It'll be available for everybody. So not just those big three players are going to be able to use this, but everyone will be able to adopt the standard. So all of your devices will be interoperable. But that would be amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it hasn't been too bad for me, John, because... A lot of these devices, uh, you know, from the different manufacturers, uh, whether it's like an Arlo camera or a TP-Link uh, smart light switch or even Dyson, uh, you know, their, their fans and, and vacuum cleaners, uh, they've done a good job of making sure that they can work with like the Google Assistant voice and Amazon Alexa voice. But th they've always had these little skirmishes, if you will, where Google and Amazon didn't get along. So you couldn't actually get YouTube on an Amazon Fire TV, like all these types of things. And it was just all kind of petty stuff. And so, look, it's like I said, I was joking, but it they literally seem to have kissed and made up and they're actually all going to work together to make the experience better for the consumer, which is really what we care about. Uh, so they'll be joined along with the Zigbee Alliance. Sounds like a bad sci-fi <laughs> villain. <laughs> um, well, Zigbee is actually the, the wireless protocol it's kind of like bluetooth yeah uh, that that uses in the background so that your your device don't actually have to have a wi-fi chip inside they can use the zigbee uh protocol okay so this isn't happening overnight uh they're no. coming up with the draft specifications uh which are due to be released in late 2020 yeah at the earliest but you know thank god at least you know there's one standard it's just stupid when you have like a vhs beta type thing happening yeah well, I'm also curious to see if they're, if this is going to be backwards compatible or if this is going to require us to buy all new stuff. Crazy. Uh, another story we're following. Uh, UK is uh, creating a, a regulator to police the big tech companies. That's a little too, too little too late. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, good on them. Don't you think? Yeah, Sure. Sure. Uh, well, it, the UK has tried a lot of these types of things. Yeah. And none of them have seemed to work. Remember they had that um, uh, pornography thing where they were blocking all the porn sites? Oh, yeah. And you'd have to go get verified that you're over, right. I forget, 19, let's right. say, yeah. before you could access porn on the internet. In the UK. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, it didn't last long. No, it died. Right. Yeah. I thought it was kind of a good idea. Yeah. Because kids will never find a way around that, John. Never. Never. Right. I wonder if they'll bring that back. So now uh, they are basically um, going to police, like the Googles and Android, uh, Apple, Amazon folks of the world? Well, we definitely seen companies like Facebook have some issues with privacy. No. No. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. No, it's, it's hard to believe. Uh, and people don't trust that their stuff is safe, yet we're still giving them all of our information on a daily basis about what we ate, uh, what kids we've just had, what pets we just brought into the world, all those types of things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it makes sense that, you know, the problem is, is that it's great that, you know, the UK wants to regulate this, but we're, they're specifically talking about US-based companies. Yeah. 
So does that mean that's going to be th throttled or, or funneled through this regulatory uh, uh, pipe in the UK? Whereas if they're in the US or they use a VPN, is it going to be a different experience? Not unlike what we saw in China, where the, the government of China blocks certain services to their citizens. Yes, but not the Chinese ones. Right. No, the American ones. So, I mean, but look at some of the numbers, though, John. Uh, Google, for example, in the UK, owns 90% of the search advertising market. Yeah. You know, that's over 6 billion pounds. And Facebook takes up about half of UK's online display advertising, you know, like banner ads and things like that, reaching 2 billion pounds in, in 2018. So you said Google has, what, 96%? 90%. So does Bing have 10 <laughs> <laughs> maybe i don't know <laughs> yahoo uh on that. marks and spencers in the uk oh. yeah crazy crazy stuff okay uh we have a fantastic show we've got great contests going on getconnectedmedia.com we're giving away an epson eco tank 4670 4760 printer sorry fantastic printer two years uh of ink built right in so you never have to last minute Sunday night go to, uh, you know, your local store to get uh, new ink cartridges uh, and an Alcatel 3V smartphone. Getconnectedmedia.com. When we come back from the break, Fitness Tech will give you the lowdown on which wearable you should buy. Well, with the holiday season comes a lot of eating <laughs> and little to no exercise. But how can we be more aware of our overall fitness? Well, as we know, there are a lot of wearables on the market. We've got our good friend, Erin Lawrence from techgadgetscanada.com. She's been trying out a few of them and we wanted to check in with her to see uh, what her thoughts were and uh, give us some recommendations. Thanks for joining us, Erin. Hello. So there's some popular wearables out there. I think Apple Watch uh, is probably one of the, the big ones for the, uh, the iPhone crowd. Also, Fitbit uh, is big as well, uh, now owned by or soon to be owned by Google. And uh, Samsung is uh, really into the, uh, the whole wearables market uh, as well. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on, on these, uh, Aaron? Like, how do you choose one? I mean, there's a lot of these out there right now. That is the big question. And for a lot of people, I think they can find all the choice that's out there pretty overwhelming. When folks ask me what they should choose when it comes to a smartwatch or a fitness tracker or some kind of device, um, there's a few questions I'll ask them. Uh, key among them is what phone or what phone operating system are you using? So I find you get the best experience when you can match your phone to the wearable. So if you're an iPhone user, an Apple Watch is going to be a great choice for you. And the reason for that is that you can get, you can take advantage of all those alerts that you can get, the push notifications that come to your watch. Whereas if you're trying to go against operating system, if you're using an iPhone, but you have a Samsung watch, sometimes you don't get all the functionality of the watch or all the interactivity that you would normally get. So that's consideration number one for me. Number two is think about the features that you really, really want and shop for those. If you're primarily going to use it for fitness or in, or for running in particular, you want something that's definitely geared towards that as opposed to trying to get your smartwatch to do things it's not made for. Um, if having a really slim profile or a small watch for your small wrists like mine uh, is a key feature, you want to shop for one of those that's going to come in a smaller size. Um, something like a Fitbit band would be ideal for that. Um, and then decide how important battery life is to you. If you're okay with charging up your fitness band, smartwatch, what have you every day, um, if you know you're just going to put it on the bedside table when you go to bed, that's fine. If you want to wear it for sleep, sleep tracking, you want to make sure you have something with a long lasting battery. And if you really hate having to charge up your devices, you definitely want something that's going to last a lot longer. Those are some great questions. Uh, I mean, some of the popular ones like the Apple Watch, you know, they've obviously got a large screen. You get all sorts of notifications on there. They run apps. Fitbit has got the Versa 2 as well, which is kind of a similar uh, form fam uh, format. And Samsung with their uh, wearables too, um, it's like a big watch, like with a big face. So I really like that question about like battery life and how big do you want these things on your wrist? So uh, I know some people, uh, they don't want a big watch. They just want a little band. They want just kind of, you know, the basic tracking. And, uh, you know, to your point, Fitbit has uh, a few good models there. 
Fitbit does have a lot of different models. They've got that Versa 2 smartwatch, which actually has Alexa functionality in it, which is kind of neat. Not for long. But if you <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want, that's probably true. If you don't want something that big and bulky and you just want something that can give you your basic step count or remind you to get up and move, um, they've got, you know, simplified fitness trackers um, like the Inspire or the Inspire HR that will just give you that simplified information, including heart rate. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, you know, when you are looking at some of these wearables, you know, they'll all track your steps, but uh, heart rate's important, don't you think? I do. I think especially if you're using it for exercise or running, you really want to know that you're getting into that zone. But what I'm finding is even, you know, older folks, seniors are finding this really helpful. This is information that they're getting from their doctors or their doctors are asking them to track their heart rate or even, you know, EKGs. A lot of these uh, devices like the Apple Watch Series 5 will give you an EKG on your wrist. So if you need that kind of medical information or need to regularly monitor your heart rate, you'll want to choose a device that has that built into it. I think that's the the key point there is because these apps will log all that stuff for you. So you're not like having to maintain a journal or something like that to show to your doctor. Absolutely. You can check in on the app anytime and it's all there and it's stored for months and years. I like the new Apple Watch uh, 5 with the fall detection as well. You know, for uh, people that are, are getting uh, up there in years and uh, might fall, uh, you know, the Apple Watch 5 can actually detect if you're falling and then uh, talk to you once you've fallen uh, and ask you if you're okay. And if you don't answer, they'll actually call uh, 911 for you. I love that. And it works. I find that the Apple Watch in particular has a lot of those features that I think are good for those older folks. So if you've got a, an older parent or a grandparent that you might be concerned about, though they might not be super into the technology, if you're able to get something like this for them where it can monitor for those falls, it can keep tabs on their heart rate. And I mean, the Apple Watch will even give you a little bit of a warning or a heads up if it detects a lower than average heart rate or that something is amiss. Uh. Which one's your favorite? Hmm. I'm making you choose, it's like asking Aaron. me, choose my favorite children. I will say I've been wearing the Apple Watch Series 4 constantly, and I've been interchanging it with the new Fitbit Versa 2. Um, I like the Apple Watch because for the exact reason that we brought up in the beginning. It, it inter interacts with my phone perfectly. I have an iPhone, so I get all those calendar alerts, those reminders, those notifications. If someone's calling my phone, I can actually take the call on my wrist. So I do appreciate that interactivity and that seamless connectivity. We're talking with our good friend Aaron Lawrence from techgadgets.com all about uh fitness wearables uh, and especially here uh the holiday season something to uh to look into uh, getting uh you know they're they're great for letting you know where you're at as far as you know uh, a fitness level like how many steps you're taking your heart rate and you can use that information to try to be better i'm still trying i've got an apple watch i'm still trying john uh it reminds me every day how crappy i am but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it thanks for joining us today aaron thank you it's prediction time for 2020. What uh, technology and telecommunications predictions can we give? Well, we've got a great guest on the line. His name is Duncan Stewart from Deloitte, Canada. He is their director of uh, research when it comes to technology, media, and telecommunications. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, there are so many here, and I always love having you on the program because it's uh, always uh, juicy stuff. Let's talk about artificial intelligence uh, first off. Are we going to see any uh, new developments in 2020? Yeah. Um, AI is the fastest growing part of technology, but historically, AI has always been done at the data center. So you had to send your picture, your voice, your location, whatever it was from your phone or other device off to a data center somewhere in California, and who knew what happened to it there? What we're talking about this year is growth in the number of chips that are used on edge devices like your phone or a smart speaker or an Internet of Things device. There's a, these, these devices, these edge AI chips, are, are poised to double over the next few years to one and a half billion units. Uh, and what they do is uh, by keeping your data on the device, if by having the AI magic work there, obviously it's more private, it's more secure, but it's also faster and cheaper. So uh, edge AI is going to be a big topic. 
Well, it's a term we hear a lot, and not everyone knows what that means, uh, edge computing. But essentially, uh, Duncan, that uh, if I could paraphrase this, these are these devices uh, that um, are like computers or, or smartphones or, or robots that uh, well, are... They are... aren't like them. They actually are our smartphones <laughs> okay. and computers and robots. <laughs> our smartphones used to be stupid and not do AI. There are new chips on our smartphones that now allow them to do AI on the device protecting your data. Is my smartphone sentient then? Is that what you're saying, Duncan? It's not that smart. <laughs> it's a little bit smarter. It's a little bit smarter than it was, but it's not all that clever. Okay. I heard the word robot. Yes. John, John and I love robots. Uh, Anything cool and new happening in 2020? Yeah, we are expecting massive growth in a different kind of robots. Historically, when we think about robots, we're thinking about those robot arms. Those are called industrial robots, and they're growing at like 0, 5, 10% a year. Instead, there's a new kind called service robots, professional service robots. They're little smart carts that roll around warehouses and logistics centers. They're growing so quickly, over 30% this year, that they're actually poised to surpass the robot arms. So robots with wheels are going to be a bigger thing than robot arms going forward. Fascinating. Uh, bikes. Uh, here in Vancouver, uh, they seem to be putting bike lanes in everywhere. I know uh, biking uh, and commuting technology obviously is improving. Uh, what kind of trends are we going to see in the next year? We're looking for the percentage of commuters around the world and in Vancouver uh, who use their bikes as their main way of getting to work to double. Uh, why? Batteries, batteries and e-bikes. Uh, I grew up in Vancouver and, uh, and I've ridden my bike in Vancouver and I've ridden my, my bike up Cyprus in Vancouver. So I'm a pretty good cyclist for that sort of thing. Show but off. not everybody wants, yeah, well, I almost died. But, you know, aside from that, it was a great ride. Um, but, but the idea is not everybody likes riding up and down hills and Vancouver's got a lot of hills. So imagine having a battery assist. This isn't a scooter where you just turn your wrist and you go. These are pedal assisted bikes. Uh, so you've got to, got to spin the wheels, got to turn your feet over and over, but it makes riding a bike much easier, faster, top speed goes up, you know, going up hills is no problem, and uh, interesting one, in the summer, you sweat less. Uh, there was a study showing that battery bikes reduce the, the amount you sweat by two-thirds, so uh, when you're commuting into the office on a hot July or August day, I'm sure your office mates are going to be pretty pleased about those battery-powered bikes. They had to do a study on that, Duncan? <laughs> well, wait, they wanted to quantify it. Everybody knew you'd sweat less. They wanted to know just how much. So two-thirds is, uh, is a start. I, I love e-bikes. Uh, I, I tried one when I was in San Francisco back uh, in, the, in the summertime, and uh, I made the mistake of uh, riding up the top, and it was glorious. It was just like the best thing ever. And then I went down, down to the marina district, and I found that uh, these e-bike rental places have zones and dead zones where you're not supposed to go. And I ended up at the bottom of the largest hill of my life. And then having to, and it didn't work anymore because it was deactivated. So having to bring that bike up that hill back into a, a regular zone, I was like, it was like pushing like a Volkswagen up, up the hill. So, <laughs> they, well, because they're heavier, right? They've got those batteries, so they're heavier than a regular bike. Yeah. Yeah. They need to make them lighter, Duncan. Well, there's limits. I mean, if you want a, if you want a decent sized battery pack, they're going to be heavy. But what you need to do then is go out and buy your own e bike, and that'll work in all zones. Talking, talking with Duncan Stewart, uh, he's from uh, Deloitte, Canada, all about uh, technology predictions. Uh, John, this is an interesting one: uh, the rise of audiobooks and podcasting, which we hope will continue to rise because <laughs> we're podcasting the heck out of this show. Yeah, we've got uh, great growth going on in both markets. Uh, audiobooks uh, growing about 25% a year, multi-billion dollar market. Uh, but uh, podcasting, a little more of an interesting story. More people in Canada listen to podcasts than audiobooks, but the revenue figures are flipped. So podcasts, and you, you, you probably know this, have a bit of a monetization problem. A lot of people listen to podcasts, but getting them to pay for them and even charging for the ads on them is a little bit of an uphill struggle. Uh, audiobooks on a per-person basis actually make two and a half times as much per year as uh, podcasts do. So podcasts, we love them. They're growing 30%, but it's still a relatively small market until they figure out that monetization issue. That's the problem we deal with every day. <laughs> <laughs> Please, won't you send money to get connected? <laughs> um, Duncan, one of the other things that you had in your, in your rundown is the rise of terrestrial television. Or I guess maybe the comeback of t terrestrial t television. Antennas. Antennas, yeah. Antennas, too. 
TV antennas. So yeah. what we are seeing uh, in the U.S., in Canada, in the U.K., around the world, but two billion people around the world still use an antenna for some or part, uh, some or all of their their traditional television. Uh, but what we're seeing in North America is that young people who are sometimes cutting the cord, canceling cable, satellite, telco, TV, uh, free up that money, put up an antenna, watch their twenty or thirty channels digitally for free, and then they add stuff like Netflix and Crave and uh, Amazon Prime to that. So they're they're complementing internet TV and antenna TV at the same time. What I found is uh, recently I took a, a TiVo onto Global to show off some new tech and the response was overwhelming and the number of people interested in a PVR for over the antenna service as well because they still want to be able to have all those features of having cable and having a PVR but not having to pay for the monthly cable fee. Although I will make a comment, and this is weird, because we have had PVRs, DVRs, TiVos for Antenna TV for a decade now. You can go buy them, and they're not even that much money, right? No, no. But but weirdly, people with Antenna TV don't seem to do that so much. We've actually got the data on that. The, the, the tendency of people who watch Antenna TV to record and then watch later is about 25 times lower than it is for people who have traditional cable. I'm not sure why. There's no technological reason. It just seems to be a data point that we have. Interesting. I wonder if it's because they're trying to save money and they don't want to pour more money into it. Yeah, but it's 100 bucks for a DVR PVR, right? So it's just not that much money. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, I noticed is that there's a pretty big network of people that are really eager to share their knowledge about antenna television and how to get it working in your particular region. So that's good news for people that are looking to get this set up for themselves. You, you said it. How many channels are you getting? I got about eight in my house without trying too hard. If I put the antenna on a higher spot in my house, I'd probably get more. According to the TiVo guide, I was potentially capable of getting about 25 channels. Really? Yeah. Depends where you are in Vancouver. Like if you think about the the south facing slope, uh, like Marpole area, you'd probably get more. Yeah, because you get all the American channels too. That's right. I I tried one, uh, but I, I probably bought the cheapest one. <laughs> it was like one of those indoor antennas. Yeah. Um, and I only picked up two channels. I think like KVOS TV. Yeah. Uh, out of uh, Bellingham and. Uh, me TV. You really need to have that sort of outside, ideally, or at least in the window up high. But the quality is amazing, though. It's uncompressed HD. So that's better than what we're getting. Yeah. Which is uh, kind of cool. Uh, but w when we're talking about video, Duncan, what about all the digital video we're getting? Like, how, how are we dealing with all that from the, a network standpoint? Um. That's a thing called, and I love this as a Canadian because it's CDN is the name of it, and that doesn't stand for Canadian just this once. It stands for Content Delivery Network. Um, we're seeing massive growth in these things. These are data centers, uh, data boxes that are being located around the world, essentially moving data closer to the people consuming it, mainly video. About 70% of, of, of the traffic on the Internet is video, and these content delivery networks are uh, uh, able to uh, um, basically when you're watching a Netflix or whatever else it is, and you stop and you pause, if that data center is thousands of miles away, that's a real real problem. So these content delivery networks bring the data closer to you so that every time you stop, start, and change channel, it's much more responsive. Do we have the networks in place uh, or the plans for these networks in place to handle all this video? I just look at the sheer amount of subscription service that are coming out now, like Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus and you know, every every week there's something new coming out, and more and more people are you know cutting the cord from cable TV uh, to go to like the Netflixes of the world. But that's all streaming through the internet. Can we handle that? Uh, yes, that's what the CDNs are doing. That the, we have the capacity out there. Uh, uh, by and large, it's not the internet connection that's the problem. It's it is the data close enough. So that's where that there's that growth in the CDN market. There are technologies now uh, using satellites that uh, will basically be able to provide internet around the world. Uh, tell us more about this, Duncan. Well, we already have some of that, but those satellites right now that do provide data uh, um, around most of the world, not so great near, near the North and South Pole, but by and large pretty good, those are located in what's called geosynchronous orbit. That's 36,000 kilometers up, which means that for the time it takes a radio signal to go from my house to them and them back means that it introduces what's called latency, and that's a real problem when you're trying to think about clicking and waiting one or one and a half seconds every single time for a response. So what they're planning on doing is launching thousands, literally thousands, tens of thousands 
of low Earth orbit satellites. These aren't 36,000 clicks up. These are like 400 to 1,500 kilometers up. Uh, and because they're so close, uh, the response is much faster. The latency is much lower. The problem is you need thousands of them to cover the Earth. We're predicting that hundreds of them will be in service by the end of 2020. Uh, and the interesting thing on this is the first areas they're going to be providing coverage to is places like Fort St. John and stuff like that. It's the high north uh, that's going to be some of the first places to see this low Earth, order, or low Earth orbit uh, data satellites uh, switch on, probably towards the back half of 2020. This is what Elon Musk is doing, isn't he? Yep, uh, uh, absolutely. Starlink and SpaceX and Musk is one of them, but Amazon's got a service as well. As a matter of fact, uh, Canada, Canada's uh, Telesat is working on this as well, and a Toronto startup uh, called Kepler is is working on a, a variant of this as well. So Canada's well represented in this. John race. and I are starting one too. It's Mike and John's uh, low-cost satellite internet service. <laughs> You're just going to have a hot air balloon. You've got a couple billion dollars. That ought to to work well. (laughs) Is this similar to what Google's doing with Project Loon, or is that something completely different? Uh, loon was balloons, hence the loon part. Right. Uh, but this is this is like really really high balloons, I guess you could put it that way. Uh, but they're just they're just satellites. They're smaller. They're smaller than the ones that hover over the equator. Uh, but there's there's more of them, and they're much lower down. And that means that you've got a problem in that you can't just point an antenna at one of them and, and leave it there. You've got to track it as it moves across the sky, which is a tricky thing and pretty cool. So you talked about getting internet service to rural areas, and I've tried satellite internet uh, before, probably back in the 90s, uh, and it was amazing because uh, it was like a farm out in Abbotsford, and they just couldn't get internet out there, but the satellite service worked. But the problem was you'd click on like the link on the website, but then it seemed like forever for it to actually go up to space. <laughs> but dial the, up to space. Dial up to space and then come back. Uh, with well, these, it does. Yeah, well. Speed of light. With the low Earth uh, orbit satellites, like, is it going to be like a, a normal experience that we get down here? Oh yeah, it, it should. It, I mean, they, they they've done some tests so far. In those tests, it is just as fast or faster than than broadband is uh, through a wire. It, it's it latency is you know so short that human beings can't even notice it. Should we be concerned? There's going to be tens of thousands of satellites up up there. <laughs> well, there's a. That's a funny question. So there's a few concerns about that. One is that a lot of those satellites, they, they're kind of bright when the sun hits them, and astronomers are worried about this. Um, uh, the bigger issue is more about them running into each other. Uh, and if that starts happening, you could end up with a lot of space junk or space debris. Now, now the companies doing that say they've got plans for mitigating that and preventing that from happening. But that's obviously one of the things that we're going to keep an eye on. Uh, you know, it's great to have uh, high-speed internet everywhere, but uh, on the other hand, we don't want a, a bunch of junk up there hitting other satellites and causing problems. Yeah, I saw that movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and uh, for a brief amount of time, George Clooney, and things did not end well. When Yeah, that same kind of content. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you uh, for all the great questions, and uh, I'll be coming out to Vancouver uh, and uh, talking more about predictions in January, so maybe I'll see some of, uh, some of the audience then. Well, at least the robots uh, haven't become sentient yet. 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 Maybe 2021, that'll be the prediction. Okay, I want to talk about the contests again. Uh, we're going to be doing this on a regular basis now, and we're going to be giving away thousands of dollars of prizes uh, in 2020. To cap out this year, though, we've got two contests going. The deadline to enter is December 31st. All you have to do is visit our website, getconnectedmedia.com, sign up for our newsletter. You're automatically entered, and you're then automatically entered for all the future contests. How can you lose? You can't. You can't. It's way better odds than 649 and Lotto Max. I'm just telling you. Uh, okay, so the two prizes. Uh, Epson EcoTank ET4670. This is a fantastic all-in-one printer. Comes with uh, two years of ink. When you run out, you buy new bottles. It is way cheaper to buy ink for this thing. And I love never having to replace cartridges on it. I wonder, because like, I don't print a lot, but I bet I could probably get five or six years of... <laughs> Well, you, you probably could. Yeah. But you know, if you've got kids, if you have kids, you have to have an EcoTank printer from Epson. Yeah. Like you'd be crazy not to because the kids are printing out color things like it's going out of style, you know, for school projects and stuff. Now you, you don't have to care anymore. So this printer is worth 600 bucks. The contest ends December 31st. To enter, getconnectedmedia.com. Uh, either go to the newsletter tab or there's a big picture of it right on our front page. So you can't really miss it. And 
We're also giving away an Alcatel 3V Android smartphone. This thing is pretty cool. It's made by TCL, the guys that make those fantastic TVs. They've uh, taken that technology into the screen. It's a beautiful screen, 6.7 inches, great sound. So fantastic for watching YouTube videos or any of your movies or TV shows and uh, full Android as well. Yeah. Which is uh, pretty smoking good. Yep. That's all the time we have left. Don't forget to check out our video podcast uh, of uh, this program either. It's at getconnectedmedia.com and uh, you can see us talking. Sometimes these segments are extended as well. So that's kind of a, a cool thing. Listen to our sister show tomorrow, the app show, only here on CKNW 980 at 10 a.m. All the latest apps. Mike and John signing off. Want to thank all the people that helped put this together. Christina, Stephen, AJ, Graham. We'll see you again next time.